Uh, welcome to this uh, slightly unusual joint ESS Max for Science Colloquium. Um, <clears throat> my name is Sindra Peterson Ochfeld. I work at ESS, and uh, together with my colleagues at ESS and Max for, uh, I organize this uh, colloquium series. Uh, we've been going for about a year, and the purpose of this series is to bring into focus the science that can be done with neutrons and the synchrotron radiation, and uh, the possibilities for the future uh, with these two facilities. Uh, the purpose is also to bring people together. Uh, we've uh, had these colloquia with ESS and Max4 staff. We've had people from the regional universities and people who are traveling through uh, visiting. Now, today, unfortunately, we're not supposed to be bringing people together. We're supposed to be avoiding it. So uh, for that reason, we've shifted the, the next three colloquia from uh, uh, from physical meetings to webcasts. And while I miss the face-to-face -face contact, I really hope this can bring some more, uh, bring a wider audience to our interesting colloquia. That is my hope. Uh, if you have some questions or comments for the speaker during the talk, feel free to email them to the email address you can see on the screen right now, which is sciencequestions at ess.eu. So sciencequestions, one word, at ess.eu. Uh, they'll come to me and then I will ask the questions after uh, the seminar so they can be addressed. So we have a fantastic speaker today, Christina Edstrom, professor of inorganic chemistry at Uppsala University. You have spent much of your career dealing with materials for energy in various forms. Uh, I know in your early career you worked a little bit with Ericsson mobile, uh, uh, mobile systems to uh, develop materials for batteries for phones, and now you have more of an interest in the automotive uh, side of things, and I'm sure we'll hear many more things uh, today. Uh, Christina is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and of the Royal, Academ uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. Uh, she's the chair of the Swedness PhD program, which is, which is focused on teaching young people to use neutron, neutron methods in their research. Uh, and also she heads the uh, Angstrom Advanced Battery Lab uh, at Uppsala University. And of course, Christina Edstrom is the coordinator of the new large EU initiative, Battery 2030. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that in this talk. And I also hope we'll hear something about the front end research of these new or at least improved battery materials that we so urgently need in order to shift away from fossil fuels. So, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so very, very much. Now I'll see if I can get this slideshow to come up. Now we we'll see if I can get some IT support from this. Yes, here I am. I hope you can see my slide now and that you can uh, follow my discussion. So thank you for that very, very nice uh, introduction. And uh, I've chosen the title Batteries for a Climate Neutral Society since this is the, the true battle that European Commission has uh, announced uh, quite recently, before the virus came into play. And, and this um, uh, means that uh, Europe should be the first climate uh, neutral continent by 2050. And that means a lot of actions where I think that batteries together with neutron uh, sources and uh, scattering tools and uh, also X-ray photons will be extremely valuable for the development of energy storage as one key technology. And uh, you are all experts on using batteries, and uh, you know they are coming in the cars. We're even seeing flying objects. What would the drones be without the light batteries that are, have a lot of, of uh, energy density? We see it coming in the smart cities as storage in buildings. Medical devices, you all know that uh, the pacemaker is a Swedish invention from the beginning. And of course, portable electronics and uh, 
uh, storage solutions in general, large scale storage, to really enable uh, renewable electricity production, etc. And I just want to repeat what Sindra just said, that if you have any questions, please send them to sciencequestions at ess.eu. And I'll try to answer them and Sindra will post them to me. So we do our best. And, uh, and um, the European Commission has actually quite recently discovered the batteries as a key technology. In Asia and US they were discovered earlier, uh, which means that we have a very, the most uh, batteries are produced in Asia. And uh, that suddenly when this needs increase dramatically, as you see on this slide, these are the projections, how much uh, the need of batteries will increase. Europe says, why, why? What, what, what about our industries? Will there be enough of batteries for us for keeping our automotive industry primarily in place? Or will they sit and wait for the, the uh, batteries to be used in other places before they come to us? So that become, became a really important question a few years ago. And the European Commission started a, something called the European Battery Alliance which collected all kinds of companies in the whole value chain that had to do with batteries. If you want to increase the number of, of batteries and the number of cars on the streets that are electric, you will need a lot of raw materials. You need to process these raw materials. You need to do it on, on what we call green energy, which is not uh, having any carbon dioxide emissions. And you need, of course, to, to really make these battery cells with the quality. And uh, if 95% of the market's uh, share of battery cell production is in Asia, and they are very skilled, you have to put a lot of actions together simultaneously. So the European Commission has increased the number of EU projects. They have increased um, the number of initiatives to write roadmaps to really have uh, uh, sort of um, the battery research and innovation going hand in hand. And in this respect, they have then also suggested to have a large scale long term research initiative, a sort of a, a collective scientific excellence base to really drive the ideas for the future, to really give the new battery industry in Europe some golden nudges. And as a result of this, of course, uh, Oh, sorry, go back. Um, the um, Commission has also come out uh, with different uh, reports on what they expect Europe to achieve within a certain time frame. And you can see that uh, 2018, they thought that in the electric cars, vehicles we have on the road will be around 4 million. It's already a lot more than that. It's going faster than we think. In 2028, it will be 50 to 200 million, and in 2040, about 900 million. And um, the battery of choice for, for vehicles so far is the lithium ion battery. It was the lithium ion battery that got the Nobel Prize uh, in, in November, December. And um, it has, uh, you can say it's the most modern of the. Uh, rechargeable batteries is the rechargeable battery with the highest uh, energy content per volume, but also gravimetric on the market. But I will show you that there are also other possibilities in the future. But this is now mature enough to take the step from smaller uh, portable electronics to a larger market to bigger applications. And you see the growth is. Uh, quite substantial on, on these expectations for 2018. And the European share of global cell manufacturing is very low, but uh, hopefully with the initiatives we see now in Germany, with Northwold in Sweden, uh, initiatives coming in Norway, etc., we hope to take more of this market. Uh, and I think that is, of course, underlying the need of research too. If you have this strong incentives for innovation will also influence research. 
Yes, yeah, just to show where the, we uh, have the market. You see, China is dominating with Korea and Japan. Uh, in that order, I would say, though, it was in Japan we really had the first commercialization of this battery 1990, which was awarded the Nobel Prize last year. You see a little bit of, of things going on in US, uh, but it's it's really Germany now, which is the driver in Europe, with a little activities also in, in France. But there are coming in embryos of different industries in, in Poland, in Romania, and of course in the Scandinavian countries. And the Scandinavian countries are very attractive because we can make batteries on, on hydropower, like Norfolk would do. So some of the uh, initiatives um, that come since 2019 is that the automotive industry has been very conservative. Now they say, okay, we go for this. Volkswagen had a diesel scandal, and I think that really influenced Volkswagen and, and how they are moving forward with BMW and Daimler. And we see Daimler goes into this more renew uh, products. Audi has more products. Uh, Volkswagen increases the plan on even building uh, factories in Germany together with Norfolk actually. And the Norfolk has pulled up uh, with both Scania and ABB with Hydro in Norway and uh, is building its site as you know perhaps in this uh, what's called Norfolk Et in Sheleftio and there was a research site in, in Westeros. So, um, Things are, are speeding up and moving up. At European level, batteries has almost as much research money now as the hydrogen and the fuel cells. The hydrogen, uh, hydrogen society has dominated the funding in Europe, but now batteries are catching up. So um, what kind of actions do we see along the full value chain? And what does this have to do with neutrons and, and, um, and uh, synchrotron facilities. Well, this is, I prefer actually to talk about a value circle because we should have some kind of circle economy than talking about uh, the different uh, a chain of it. And we have the raw materials, the smart materials we need to do. And of course, I will show you some scientific examples where I hope to really show how subtle this is to handle this with the materials and how much characterization we need to really understand what's going on in the battery. Um, we have to have the low energy cell production, I'm oh, sorry, and the cell production as such is uh, also something that we more and more see that we need to build robotic lines and uh, actually follow what's going on during both the synthesis and the cell production. We need to uh, have, of course, production process uh, innovation, battery systems that you build up, they build uh, together in a box all these different battery cells that you can't make too large uh, and then connect them together. That's called the battery management system. They have second life. When, when a, a box of battery cells have been used in a car, you need to show the different battery cells, how, how they live, how they what state of health they have, and then you need characterization, imaging techniques, simple ones, together with electrochemical techniques, to use the batteries in the new application, second life. And of course, recycling and reuse, extremely important to use characterization tools of different kinds to really understand uh, the, the, the materials, the part of the materials, etc. How, what quality they have, can they really go to the new production of battery cells or not, etc. <clears throat> so this with batteries, you have a, a lot of different things you have to sort of take into account. You, you have to uh, look at safety, you have to look at regulation, important importance is uh, the environmental aspects are important. The safety is something people ask about. The more energy you put into a container, closer it comes to a bomb. So how can we control these chemistries without having them to, to misbehave, we can say. And we have to think about cost, cost efficiency, sustainability. Um, 
So what is a battery? Well, I think you all know how it looks because you're using it daily in several different applications. But it's really very simple. It has three parts. It has an anode, a cathode, and an electrolyte. And um, what makes the battery so useful is that it has a very high efficiency in converting chemical energy to electricity and reverse. So this means that the lithium battery, you can uh, charge and discharge for several thousands of cycles before it starts to degrade, which is a really important property because if you want a good electric vehicle, you don't want to uh, exchange the battery uh, until eight, 10 years perhaps in the use of the car. And uh, that is, we are coming to that point now where we can promise the best batteries. These are not the batteries you have in laptops and mobile phones because they are not optimized for its long lifetime because you are changing your mobile phone or your laptop more often. And if you then combine this high efficiency with the high efficiency of electric motor, which is well above 95% for transport applications, you outperform the combustion engine and fuels as, uh, based on efficiency. Then there are other negative things, of course. Uh, every technique has its pros and cons. And, and what the lithium battery needs to become better on is, is actually the temperature range. It needs to be better at lower temperatures. It needs to be more safe at bit higher temperatures. And of course, they need to be lighter because uh, the, it's a heavy component, an expensive component in your car even though the price for the batteries have decreased dramatically the last year. And batteries are flexible and easy to scale up. So a lithium ion battery can actually be miniaturized to put on a chip uh, to control some uh, little electronic things, as well as it can be upscaled to have being containers for large case storage. So what is a good battery? I think um, what we are facing in, in the world as battery scientists is that the interest for this is so large now, the money is so huge, so that there are a lot of different things um, coming out in, in papers and said as remarkable, outperforming, fantastic uh, super batteries. But for you then to have a little bit of um, knowledge when you go out and, and see is this what comes out in the press really realistic uh, or not. Uh, a battery should be able to be cycling for a long time. It should be fast to recharge. It's got a safety, no side reactions, small weight and volume, low cell discharge. It means that if you put the battery fully charged on a shelf, and take the battery out one year later, you should keep the high storage in the battery. It's called shelf life in, in the battery world. You should have no memory effects, non-toxic, low cost, high voltage, high capacity, high energy density, high power, high power density. There are many, many uh, requirements and often they are conflicting when you really want to make a good battery. So that's why you don't see one solution, but it's a whole rich family of different solutions. And that's why the research is so rich in this area. Now, and the more complex picture then of the battery is that it's actually not only a negative electrode, a positive electrode and electrolyte. It's actually a lot of things going on. You have current collectors, uh, copper on one side, aluminum one, some to a lithium battery. You have cracking of particles while they are, uh, this battery is cycling back and forth uh, with the lithium ions intercalating in, into the atomic structures on, on the negative side or the positive side. And you have a, a buildup of interface layers between the electrolyte and the electrode, and you can have corrosion reactions. You have like particles that you have to optimize in size, and they are sort of um, mixed in a slurry with uh, conducting extra small uh, particles, often of carbon, and they have a sort of rubber type of polymer binder to keep this electrode together. And all this can react in different ways. You can also have structural disorder 
the disordering in, in your uh, electrodes that can give you sort of negative things. So there are so many things and aspects to look at. And often, very often, um, we do this uh, ex situ, you, you have to open your battery and look at the things, which is not really always in the most realistic thing. So this development we see now at neutrons and synchrotrons that you actually can do more and more realistic studies in operando. Why do we don't need to open this to learn things about what's going on? It's so, so important and uh, as coordinator for this large scale research initiative for batteries, I see this as the perhaps most important things to continue with. Oh. Now something happened. Sorry about that. I did something stupid. I want to go to change. Can I have IT support? I want to go to the next slide. Yes, what happened? It's just uh, stuck, and I want to go oh. to the next slide. Oh, there. So going, thank you so much. Going back then uh, to this um, uh, circle, uh, sustainability circle, I think the role of neutrons and photons, you can find it really in every uh, of uh, these parts. So for me, as a coordinator of Battery 2030 Plus, I'm really grateful for the interest from LEAPS, which is the uh, joint effort of the synchrotrons in Europe to actually collaborate, and LANS, which is the corresponding neutron uh, legal uh, uh, entity in Europe for, for uh, collaboration between the neutron facilities. Because I think with this kind of bodies, we have the chance to really, from the battery researcher side, say, we want to uh, really be part of developing different techniques and, and also uh, see possibilities in the future. I, I just put some sort of buzzwords uh, around this. We need to understand better synthesis processes, both, um, uh, I would say, inorganic and organic and polymer compounds. We need to order, they understand the order and disorder. We have soft matter. We have magnetic compounds. Many of the electromaterials are magnetic. We have to understand the battery cell and its poor structures and what's going on when you discharge and charge. Do you have clogging because of aging effects? We need to understand better the durability and safety of battery cells. Crosstalk between components of the cell. And if you have stress and strain in the system, etc. So um, I talked a lot about the lithium battery and in this slide you see different possibilities. You see on the um, lower left corner, the lead acid, which has a very low uh, volumetric and gravimetric capacity. Still, it's the most sold battery in the world because it's so robust. We have the nickel cadmium, which we produce in Oskarshamn in Sweden. Uh, it's for stationary storage. We have nickel metal hydride that we produce in Gävle. And then we have the sodium ion coming uh, out soon on the market, and we have lithium ions. Uh, one question I often got, get is, do we have enough lithium? And the answer is yes. The problem is, where do we find it? It's a little bit of a geopolitical problem. Therefore, people have looked, started to look at sodium again, because you find sodium everywhere. And you lose a little bit of capacity, but you still have a lot. The holy grail right now uh, is to come to something called solid state batteries with lithium metal as the negative electrode, which is uh, a safety problem, but uh, very interesting research. And then there are a number of other divalent kind of batteries, even trivalent. We have lithium sulfur, we have organic batteries, and lithium oxygen. I place them out because some of them are, are having very high. Uh, gravimetric capacities, but very low volumetric, and then they are not interesting for cars, but for other applications. And by showing this slide, I just want to give one message, and that is what we probably, due to the need of raw materials, need to differentiate what battery should we use when and for what. And I would say for a long time, 
the lithium ion battery will be the battery of choice for, for cars and it can be improved. You can actually go along this uh, line towards the solid state battery with new uh, positive electrode materials, primarily, but also negative, which is sort of a driving at the moment currently. This is then back to the lithium ion batteries. I just want to also show you that within the lithium ion batteries, it's a, also a family of, of, of choices. So you can actually, a, a battery for a, a mobile phone has not the same content as the battery for an electric vehicle, because, but, but they have very much the same principle in how they function. And you see, Going to real uh, lithium metal will give us the highest energy content in the battery. But we are here today with graphite in the commercial ones, and the reason for that is that it's a safety thing. And but if you look at the positive electrode materials, you see that they have lower um, capacity, gravimetric capacity than graphite. So graphite is still doing fine. The holy grail is really to press the positive electrode to higher capacities. You see, you can do that either by trying to shift the amount of lithium you can host in the, the atomic structure, or press uh, and or press the potential up to higher potentials. So um, uh, the negative and positive electrodes, what you're doing when you get your batteries so that you have the Lithium ions in the positive electrode, when you start by charging it, you push the lithium ions into the layers between the graphene sheets, and then you can start using it. So it's sometimes called a rocking chair battery. And you have organic solvents as the electrolyte, which is also a discussion, is it toxic or not? And a lot of research is in the electrolyte side today, not only on the whole degree to find new cathode materials that are better. So my first example will be a little bit about in, uh, the neutron part. And uh, in situ neutron diffraction, I use that and battery as the search word for, for uh, Web of Science to see how many publications we have. And I think it's, it's actually now it's happening. It's now we are starting to really new, use neutrons for batteries. And the first example of a battery cell that we was uh, presented was from 1998, and that was a study by myself at Stutzvik here in Sweden. But you see, um, the success rate of that was not that big, so we didn't have, we had a few publications on it, but then we sort of left it. And then we started ourselves, so we are part of this uh, group here since 2011, where we started to make new cells and colleagues started to make cells. So the reason why um, there actually are quite a only a few uh, studies so far using uh, special made cells, uh, research made cells, uh, and the reason is this, of course, that uh, you need to really be able to have a lot of materials. You need to maybe wind your electrodes in, in a proper way to have good electrochemistry and so on. So it turns out that most of the publications are on, on commercial batteries, which is not bad at all, because there you can really look at durability effects, you can see the different components, how they interact, and so on. But when you look at the special cells made, you can see a lot of work from Australia, there are from France, and Switzerland is coming up with PSI. Uh, and uh, of course, our own work uh, together with, with some British scientists from ISIS, see that you have to sort of decide, do you want to make your cell to give you really excellent diffraction pattern, or do you want it to give uh, excellent electrochemical signals? So it's a little bit a trade-off, because you have a lot of uh, hydrogen uh, uh, in, in your electrolyte uh, solvents, for instance, and, and uh, you need to really go up to a little bit more of materials than you normally have in a battery. But we have uh, worked ourselves with, at ISIS with Stephen Hart here, and we have actually been able now to make, go from this quite large wound cell that we made for Polaris uh, to a more smaller coin cell type. 
So it's, it's much cheaper, you need much less material, you need less of deuterated electrolyte, but you have a smaller D space range uh, that you can access when you have this one. But this is much more close to what you see in a real battery. While this one is really more giving you the better uh, diffraction pattern. And the three uh, scientific uh, cases I will uh, browse through with you now are uh, compounds that might look rather similar. These are uh, hopefully future types of coupled materials that can give you higher content, energy content in a lithium battery. It's nickel manganese oxide, uh, it's a lithium rich manganese oxide, and it's a lithium rich manganese oxide also containing some cobalt. And you see that the main component here is manganese. This is sort of not the case for the commercial batteries coming out today. They have nickel as the main component. And if you go earlier in time, it was cobalt. The cobalt is something you want to get rid of. But there is not more of manganese. So it's a sort of a dream, a wet dream for a scientist to really be able to increase the manganese in this kind of cathode. So if we look at the first one that we call LNMO, because we have a lot of abbreviations because these uh, compounds are so, have so long names. It's a spinel structure, it's cubic, so the lithium ions can go out and in in the three dimension in this compound. And it's what's called a high uh, voltage cathode. And that is then giving you the high capacity. And I put in the lithium cobalt oxide here, which is typically one you have in your mobile phone. So you can see that this is the sort of this plateau here is here for lithium cobalt. So it's really giving a lot more of the capacity. And here on this slide here in the left corner, you see the more classical lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide, the NMC that you see in the cars coming out today from Korea and from <coughs> from many of the car manufacturers. You also see lithium iron phosphate, which are in many of the buses in, for instance, uh, China. So this uh, is very promising because it can give you this very high specific energy and this very high energy density. And it's fast diffusion of the lithium ions, which is good, and it's seen as environmentally friendly. And uh, this compound you can find in an ordered phase or in a disordered phase. And you get uh, the uh, ordered one uh, if you anneal your uh, synthesis below 700, or, and the disordered one if you anneal it above 750. And uh, this ordered phase is then thermodynamically more stable. You have very specific manganese and nickel sites. Uh, and here you have a random mixing of manganese nickel in this one. And the interesting thing is when you put it into a battery and you charge and charge it, it's this disordered phase which gives you much better electrochemical performance. So why? Well, um, one thing one has to look at when it comes to study this high voltage cathode are the electrolytes. And it turns out that um, uh, both these two compounds, the ordered and disordered, rather fast fading uh, and the electrolyte oxidation uh, at high potential is one cause for this. But despite this, the disordered one is much better. You have also some kind of manganese and nickel dissolution, which means that you, you actually find the nickel and manganese uh, in the electrolyte and on the surface of the counter electrode. Uh, so you have actually poisoning the anode of this. And you see a lot more manganese and nickel dissolution for the ordered one. So uh, what we did then was that we, um, speed up here, we actually decided to look at a really oxygen full, so that we really had the full uh, and not the defect structure. And you are having this oxygen pressure, we actually did a thermal study using neutron diffraction to, to really see what, how will that ordering, disordering 
formation. Uh, when is that uh, happening and how is it, uh, what's going on? And you, what you see is that you have the a disordered, uh, you have the ordered uh, peaks up here to around uh, 600, uh, this uh, satellite peaks here, and you start to heat this up. When you go to higher uh, temperatures, you come to the disordered place. And if you go to really high temperatures, you, you actually uh, really have the disorder one. And this uh, gave us a, a clear picture in what interval we could find our uh, disordered structure before it collapses again when you're uh, into the, uh, this temperature range here where we have the disorder. And uh, this was not enough because uh, we need also to combine uh, knowing that we have this very disordered structure uh, with some kind of a redox uh, chemistry to do the electrochemistry of this uh, compound. And uh, to our uh, interest, we could find that we cannot only explain this high potential by being nickel 2 plus uh, and nickel 4 plus redox couple. We have to use RICS and, and uh, absorption spectroscopy to, to show that oxygen takes a significant role in the charging compensation. So this RICS data that was taken by, by uh, Lauren Duda's group in Uppsala, he's uh, in the group that are building the Veritas beam line with Max4, uh, was very instrumental for explaining what's going on. But this is not enough. We also went to um, Stockholm University and did some TM studies. And if you look at the, uh, an ordered structure that have cycled for 10 times, we see that there is a buildup uh, on the surface of the particle. But we actually see that instead of having uh, this uh, LNMO structure, we get a rock salt structure here near the surface. Well, if we go to the disordered one, we do, uh, and after 10 cycles, we don't see this. We see a lot smoother surface. And, and by doing some also experiments on the surface, and especially Hux test that we did in Berlin in Bessy, we could see that it was not only that we had this rock salt like phase here for the ordered. One, we also got a lot of, of um, uh, surface species and uh, build up of an interface which was rather thick to the electrolyte. And if you have the disordered one, you can see that you have this anion reaction all through, but you never really got this rock salt like phase here. And you got also very much thinner film of this, uh, of this material. So my, to give a general conclusion, it should be clear that subtle changes in synthesis conditions, there are other examples that are even more subtle than this, influence battery performance. So particle size, particle orientation, particle uh, morphology, uh, and of course the atomic structure plays a big role. And we, all, more, we must know both the bulk structure and the interface composition to optimize the overall performance. We must under, really understand these redox processes. So my second example is a lithium-rich variation of this LNMO. And uh, here we used HAXPES, which means that you can uh, tune your photon energy to get to the surface and then deeper and deeper in. This is done in this case, is done a diamond in the UK. Normally we go to Berlin to do these things. And again, it was more to try to see, can we understand this kind of anion redox reaction that people start to believe that they exist? I think we were one of the first to really show it with uh, Laura Duda some years ago, but I think that's forgotten. And it, it turns out that we can say that we have in the spectra an oxygen, um, two different oxygens and, and uh, an oxidized oxygen on the surface 
that can show that the oxygen is really part of the redox process. And uh, what you normally do when you do these experiments is that, of course, it's very time consuming. You, you make an electrode, you go uh, put it at a certain place in this uh, charge discharge cycle, and you go to that, let it equilibrate, you open your cell, you, you, you wash it, and then you make your measurements. So you, you understand there are many samples you have to, to work on. You have to repeat the samples so that you really know that you have some kind of statistics on it. So it's very time consuming. So go to an upper random situation for this kind of uh, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy would be a dream situation. Of course, we transfer always these uh, samples very carefully from gas boxes to spectrometers. We have been several chambers to do this uh, exchange and play with this a lot. And uh, in this case, you can see that we have uh, uh, can look at the um, the oxygen spectra both uh, as a function of the potential where we have sort of taking our sample and also at the depth. And by co correlating that to, to also the nickel spectra, we can see that also the nickel is, is of course redox active in this case. And if we take all the uh, characterization techniques together and put this jigsaw puzzle to, to a common picture, we can see that we start with our pristine compound our particle, which has a little bit of lithium loss because you have surface bound species. Car carbonates are formed because of carbon dioxide in the air. You, you start to charge your sample, you get the lithium ions into this particle, and you have uh, redox reactions coming out. And you have then, uh, you discharge it, and you get sort of uh, a layer uh, that is thicker formed on the surface. And after 10 cycles in discharge state, you do get some kind of uh, phase separator where you have more of the anion redox reactions in the surface and more of the nickel ones in the bilge. So a little bit similar picture as the previous example. So it looks like we have some kind of depth dependent redox reaction in this particle. And both metals and oxygen are redox active and again, we need to understand this even better to make better electrode materials for Norfolk to, to really be, become a player, as one example. My last example that I will just browse for quickly, I tend to like to talk about batteries, so I speak far too long, is a study we did uh, which also shows that you need to work with many characterization techniques at the same time. And again, is this. Uh, I mean, manganese is rich one and it's sort of lithium rich and it has a huge capacity compared to the other one. But you see, you lose a lot of it during the first cycle. So what's really happening here before it gets nice? So it means that this is very detrimental if you want to build a battery on this uh, because you, you lose a lot of, of the capacity already in the first charge. Um, and what you can see here is uh, it's been a big debate about this compound that you have an oxygen loss and that the oxygen loss is, is actually um, a reason for the capacity fading. And so in this case, we done, did some DMS studies, mass spectrometer studies and could see that, yes, we had uh, predicted um, gas evolution of oxygen and we could experimentally verify these but we can also see carbon dioxide. So by again using SX and, uh, and Rix and Raman and Sains and all kinds of methods and follow again this G charge, charge curve, especially the first cycle then, first charge, we can see that we do have, this is the oxygen K edge, we have reactions here. There is something happening here. Oh, sorry. Um, Raman spectra also shows that there is an oxygen reaction. And here in the RIGS, we could also see that there were actually um, 
a lot of defects formed in the ox oxide lattice in, this, in the structure, in the bulk structure. And uh, I think uh, to make a long, long story short, uh, this operandum mass spectrometry show that oxygen is extracted. But the interesting thing is that the lithium uh, plus removal is charge compensated by the formation of localized electron holes on oxygen atoms coordinated by manganese and lithium ions. And uh, this served to promote the localization, not the formation of true peroxide. So instead of having oxygen gas, we have true peroxide. So then, to, to really build this conclusion, you need data from the Sachs, Ram, and Riggs, Sains, etc. And uh, could even quantify uh, the charge compensated by oxygen removal and by formation of electron holes on the oxygen atoms. And this, uh, I think, is now almost one of my <laughs> most cited papers, but I, I can tell you not everyone trusts these results. It's an ongoing debate. So the dream is, of, to, of course, to go up around and to do that and, and leave all these batteries, the opening, the lab boxes, the transfer chambers, transfer and then to see the structures and understand the interfaces, etc. And uh, I, I just want to point out the work that Associate Professor Maria Aline from Uppsala moved now from physics to my group, so I'm very proud to have her in my group, uh, to do ambient pressure PS at HIPPI at Max 4 and also at Species. And uh, really to try to do something really, really novel try to look at, for instance, uh, electrolyte drops and try to see what, what kind of surface effect that we have between the a liquefied drop and the, in this case, a lithium metal. Uh, and uh, see that that actually the, bulb, the, the, um, the components close to the lithium surface is that actually different from the components on the surface of the droplets came out in, in Nature Chemistry last year, so I think that's interesting. And that we actually can do, trying to really do the first electrochemistry, and it's not so easy uh, to see anything in this, these plots yet, but we have now data that we are just sent in for publication that we hope might be very appreciated by the scientific community. This is uh, um, experimentally difficult and also to really trace when you have a liquid solid interface to really see this interface and not just come into the droplet and, uh, and there are lots of things going on in electrodes that you in that case can take care of. And by ending this I just want to point out that the Budget 2030 Plus which is this large scale research initiative have a roadmap that is just recently published on the, on the web page uh, and uh, that we have suggested new RNA actions where I would say put uh, the lens and leaps uh, activities in the center. And the one I want to paint out especially is what's called the battery interference genome or material saturation pl platform, sorry I've written wrong, uh, where we can see that we need to really um, accelerate the finding of new materials, new concepts, we need to test them and characterize them. We need to take all the data. We are producing so much data. We, we are charging and charging and they're charging and charging. We are not really using all the data. But by trying to, to work together with new theoretician and the new tools with artificial intelligence, yes, I know it's a hype, but I think in this case it can be a very useful hype. Uh, I hope that we can build a platform in the nearest 10 years for Europe and for research that can be really, really good. Marrying together Euro and HPC together with the LEAPS and, and uh, LENS initiatives and, and of course ESS and Matura are always in the center of my heart in this, um, this future. So uh, with this I just want to thank you all for listening. I want to talk Thank all the people at different synchrotrons and neutron facilities that helped us through the years, and all PhD student postdocs colleagues and collaborators all over the world, and of course all the funding agencies 
And please send in questions for sciencequestions at ess.eu. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christina, for that uh, very, very interesting talk. I hope you can sense the applause, although you can't hear it. <laughs> um, it's really very, uh, very clear from what you show that uh, when it comes to these very complex systems, uh, no one method stands alone, but you really need this uh, wide uh, range of methods available to you. Um, yeah. I'll uh, start with uh, a question from uh, Ute at ESS. Uh, to Christina, could you uh, please provide a brief update on the development of the battery partnership, uh, like scope and stakeholders and budget and timeline and such? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, the battery partnership is an, uh, a public-private uh, partnership. It means that it's the industry that is, sits in the driving seat. And uh, the purpose is that we should uh, prof preferably have one in Europe, and that is a negotiation between uh, associations. So it's very much uh, associations that need to be uh, sort of the ap applicants and so on. And in this case, the, the, uh, the people are from IMIRI, which is the materials. It's Umicore and Solvay in, in Europe. And it's also UCAR, which is the automotive industry. And it's the EASE, which is Large Case Storage Association. And the Battery 2030 Plus, we have been allowed into the uh, discussions, the negotiations. So we sit at the same table as the different uh, directors, which are DG Connect, DG RTD, DG Energy, DG Climate, DG Growth, maybe DG environment. This uh, partnership is to complement other partnerships. There is a partnership for transportation, for instance, that also would take some parts of batteries into their account. But we are, so we are more at the materials and the battery cell production part, which sort of fits with Battery 2030 Plus. Battery 2030 Plus is written into this, and we are the board, the governance board, will be six people from industry, one from a university, I have fighted for that one, you should know, and one for our TEOs, uh, the, the institutes. So uh, and that is seen as a success. Uh, the last version of the application is going in now. Uh, the idea was that this decision should be taken before the summer. I feel that there is a very unclear situation, a lot due to the budget. So uh, this is, I don't know, you know that there are three pillars in uh, Horizon, Europe, uh, Horizon Europe, and these partnerships, they are in, in um, pillar two, while the infra, large scale research infrastructures are in pillar one. And back to 2030 plus, we want to be promiscuous. We want to be in every pillar. So, <laughs> so that is the status. That's uh, as much as I know. I have the last version of the application in my mailbox to read tonight, actually. I, I hope it answered your question. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, there's also a question from uh, Andreas Schreier, also at ESS. Um, how do you see the competition between hydrogen and electrical power uh, batteries as energy sources for future mobility? Uh, isn't there a role for both? Yes, yes. It's so wonderful for being a battery scientist because I, I would say there will be no fuel cell car without a battery. <laughs> no, but uh, I think we will take uh, different segments. Uh, on, uh, of the market. I think you will see more of, of fuel cells maybe in the large scale, I mean, trucks and, and so on coming. But I mean, I've heard this since I started with batteries in the mid 90s. There has been this, oh, the fuel cell car, car will come in five years' time. So I'm still waiting for it to come a little bit. But yeah. it might be that the batteries are paving the way for the fuel cell cars, actually. Yeah, I, I had a question myself along the same lines. When, when you started out with uh, uh, 
the sort of projections of what we would be seeing on the roads in the future. There, were, there it was a huge increase of, of electrical cars, and I was wondering what assumptions had been made there, because uh, was the assumption that all cars would be battery driven, or some would be hydrogen? Do you do you know sort of what that what that number assumed? Um, I think they have at this stage assumed that most cars will be electric, but you see different estimates of this. You can see also that uh, it depends on who you're asking, that uh, maybe the uh, electric, uh, the, the batteries take 40% of the car market um, rather than 100%. We have 1 billion cars on the globe, and the question is also, can we have so many cars totally, or, or will it be a reduced market as such? I don't know. We see, I mean, we see all the constraints in Europe uh, trying to get the, the cars out of the cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many threats to the automotive uh, industry. But I think, yeah, I see uh, batteries also being important for medical devices and so on. So, and the whole autonomous society with robotics and so on will also require batteries. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So it may be we have to divide the market so the fuel cells will take more. I think we have very little of fuel cell initiatives in Sweden and re compared to Europe as a whole. And I think that Europe as a whole are much more used to using gas as an energy source. In Sweden, we are so focused on electricity as it is. So it has really not really had a big play here as it has in the rest of Europe. Uh, while I'm sure people are collecting their thoughts to send a few more questions, but uh, meanwhile, well, I, I would like to ask, I, I, I might have missed something you said, but uh, I know that neutrons are specifically sensitive to lithium uh, as yes. an element and, and good at discerning lithium from other stuff going on. Is this something that you can make active use of? Uh, in oh, your research? absolutely. That's hmm. what we really do. And I think what we also make a uh, very important use of is that uh, it's very hard with X-rays to distinguish between nickel, manganese, and cobalt. With X-ray diffraction, I should say. X-ray diffraction. So if you want to, to look at the atomic structure, there are so many good things with lithium, uh, with neutrons, sorry, that you can actually, uh, in, a, in a much better way, tell something about the lithium reactions. The mechanism for that. And that's very important. Uh, yes, here's a question uh, from uh, Claire VVA. I'm sorry if I pronounce that wrong. <laughs> sorry. She knows it much better than I do. Hello, Claire. Dear <laughs> <Yeah>, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I exposed myself there. So, dear Christina, thanks for the great talk. Um, what, about, what about the deuterated electrolyte in the operando neutron cell? Did you try some recipe described in the literature that works or that's declared to work well without being deuterated? Uh, uh, we have mainly used deuterated electrolytes. I haven't really found any good recipes. Uh, of course, another thing for neutrons which might be a bit tricky is that many of these electrolytes have a lot of fluorine also, which also can add to the incoherent scattering of the background. But uh, so it, sometimes we play with other swords. But uh, it, it, it's so interesting that it goes so well with the uh, commercial batteries. It seems so, like they have been able, in a better way than we do as scientists, to optimize the amount of electrolytes. So it seems to surprisingly work, uh, despite all the hydrogen and so on. I could actually pose the question back to her. <laughs> Okay. She has really, really done a fantastic job, I would say, at PSI earlier, now now at, uh, at TA in Grenoble. So, 
So uh, we will see more of Claire in the future, I can tell you. Good, we look forward to that. I look forward to have you involved in Battery 2030 Plus. I have to tell you a secret, this battery, this uh, big map has been granted, so we will start that work in September. But that is... <laughs> you realize we're on the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so I have a, a bit of a, a general question. I mean, this all the stuff you've been presenting, it's extremely relevant and it's very close to application. Um, what would you say are the most interesting aspects in, term of, in terms of a fundamental understanding of, of matter and, and chemistry? I, I right now, I, I do think that the, the, it's really fundamental to understand what's going on with the interfaces because there you have the electron transfer reactions and and also where the, the um, if it's lithium or sodium or, or calcium going in. So, so to start uh, looking at more uh, neutrons at, at the interfaces will be very important also. I know there are some attempts to do re reflectometry studies that very interesting from a fundamental point of view. So, um, yes, uh, a lot of fundamentals on what's going on really at the interfaces are important. Well, it's a quarter past four, so I think it's probably a good time to round off. Thank you so much for this really interesting hour, Christina. I think we've had a lot of followers. I can't really see the numbers at this point, but fortunately I've had some reports of people not being able to see this, which means we've maxed out the license. So <laughs> thank you so much for, <laughs> for your talk. And thank you everybody else for, for joining us uh, for this webcast. It will be posted if you have friends who weren't able to make it or if you'd like to see it again. We will post the link of this recording at the same web page where the, the link was, uh, was posted now. Um, also, uh, I hope you'll join us for our uh, coming webcasts uh, on May 13th. We have on May 13th we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Thomas Helweg from Bielefeld University to speak on soft matter topics. Mm -hmm. And on June 10th, yeah, very interesting. And on June 10th we have Paul Nissen from Aarhus University to talk about life science. So a couple of really good talks coming up there. I hope uh, you will all join us again. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. Appreciate that a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>